Hi, this is Deep Tran. And I'm Jose Solis. And we're your token theater friends, people who love theater so much that Jose was even thinking about it while he was on, while he was out of town this past week. How was the nature, Jose? Well, all the world is a stage, and I pretended that the wild animals that I saw were part of a play, so you know how that goes. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're, uh, like, you're like Rosalind <laughs> going out into the forest of Arden. I love your background so much. I'm obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, you, you cannot see this on the podcast, but I have changed the background of my screen to the toilet in Parasite because that is where my mind is at right now. Oh, no, but we do have a video version also, so you can appreciate and worship and praise Deep for her very thoughtful, very funny, it's so funny, very funny background if you also watch our web series. (laughs) Yes, uh, the weirdest thing about this new venture that we have created is, like, I have to be on camera for, like, an hour now, and... I don't know how I've I've had a hard time like listening to my listening to myself, but like watching myself, like I don't know how you edit those videos and just not cringe every single time you see you see your own face. Oh, I do constantly, which means I need to talk to my analyst more about more self love. I guess no, there's no such thing as self love when you're a journalist and you have to listen and watch yourself. Well, on the bright side, you look flawless. Your skin looks flawless. So, Thank you. Yeah, good to go. What are we going to be talking about this week? Uh, this week is a little bit, you know, where we're all over the place this week. First off, uh, we're going to be talking about a petition that's been circling around the Internet. It, it's called We See You, White American Theater, and over 50,000 People have signed it, including some very famous people like Sandra O. Oh. Like, yes, that's why we stand killing Eve. So we'll be talking about that and what we hope to see from that. And then this week we wanted to do something a little bit lighter because last week's discussion was quite... Everything's been heavy. Life is heavy. And we want to... We don't want to talk about sad things. We want to... Talk about happy things, some happy talk, as they say. So we're going to be discussing The King and I in the second segment of this episode. It does not make me happy, but it makes Jose very happy. So we will dive into that. And and for the interview today, who are we talking to? Today, well, before we say that, I want to clarify that the reasons why it makes me happy are not the reasons why it makes you unhappy, just to say that, all right? Today, we are going to be talking to the fantastic April Mathis, who you have seen on stage in plays like Tony Stone, which was at Roundabout last season, for which which she was nominated for a Drama Desk Award, so yay, April. But today, we're going to be talking about work that a lot of actors have been doing quarantine. And April has been collaborating on a podcast called Playing on Air. So we're going to be talking to her about that, about her career, and what she's doing right now. And it's a fabulous interview, so stay tuned for that. Yep. And uh, for the first segment, Jose, do you want to run down the We See You What letter? Okay, sure. We are going to add a link to the actual letter. So let me just paraphrase what it was about. At some point last week, there was a letter that came out. Uh, I love the logo because it's like an eye and it's like very taro-y. It's like super cool. But the letter basically It seems Egyptian to me, like, you know, the eye of Ra. Oh, remind me to to do you a taro reading with my new Egyptian deck then, by the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, it's this all-seeing eye. And that's what that represents, basically. And it's a wake-up call to white theater. It's called We See You White American Theater, which kind of feels like, I don't know, like very redundant because white white and American theater go like hand in hand, but whatever, that's a whole other story. 
this letter, the people behind it were basically saying, and I don't want to like patter backs, but I think we kind of do. They basically have been saying what we have been saying for two years while we've been doing this. And also what you have been saying your entire career when you, you know, you write your op-eds about uh, Miss Saigon and all those other things that are bullshit. And like, I am, you know, they're a little bit late and I'm not gonna judge them for that. I'm proud and I'm so happy that this is finally happening because there's a reckoning coming. And I don't want to sound like Prospero or some like crazy old man out of a Shakespeare play, but there will be a reckoning. And we are at the beginning of what needs to be a revolution in the American theater of restarting and seeing that we have been doing very, very, very poorly, but especially white people have been responsible for that. They have been keeping us down. They have been keeping black artists excluded. You know, they faced racism 24 seven. And one of the most heartbreaking things that I've seen recently was that uh, testimonial that Montana Levi Blanco did. He's one of my favorite designers. He's a fucking genius. And when you hear him talking about something like that, when he, when you know, like you think he's so respected and he's so loved. And the thing is, when you see that something like that is happening to someone who you think is doing all right, imagine about all the people whose names you don't know. Imagine about all the stagehands and all the managers. Imagine all the lighting people, all the tech people, you know, all the people who haven't broken through to talk about that because it's really scary. I mean, I don't know about you, Deep, but I am always terrified before I click send to a draft to an editor or whenever I hit publish when we're working on self-publication. I am always terrified of how the words I write or say are going to land because I'm so tired of being angry and I'm so tired of being sad and I'm tired of being disappointed in people. And I'm taking this like on another, like, you know, like on a different road but it totally relates to we see you. And the fact is that we have seen you for a long, long, long time, American theater. So I'm sad, but I'm also proud that we are finally seeing a lot of people and most importantly, famous people and celebrities because they are the ones who are hurt and they're finally talking about this. So. You know, the letter is admirable. The design is beautiful. My only concern about this letter is that it it's coming off as a little bit too vague for my taste. And it's like, you know, it's almost kind of like the MTA going, if you see something, say something. Well, guess what? We have been saying it. Yeah. Oh, my God. So much stuff that just happened right there and everything you said. Okay, so first off, uh, the We See You letter was originally created by 30 theater makers, like joint theater makers, their coalition, and and then it and then they released it and then it expanded to 50,000 sig signatures. And then I've been told that they're going to compile a list of demands for white theater theater producers and institutions and so I'm really looking forward to seeing what those demands will be because and I'm writing a, I'm currently writing figuring wrapping my mind around like writing about this but I feel like it's kind of like that Washington Post op-ed that was about when black people are dying white people join book clubs it's about like how some, some people a lot of people think saying, oh, I hear you, I understand you, I've done so much reading, If let me know how I can help. Like saying those things are enough when they're not and they're and the and the fact that that's always a go to and it never gets to another part of the conversation, which is I will commit to doing this. I will commit to not working with all white creative teams. I will commit to making sure my season, the plays that I finance are dive from diverse writers like there's no there's there's never any real big concrete commitment that you can see that you can measure. And so I'm really hoping that there will be and that we, that all of us, every, everyone, white people, you know, black people, all of us will, 
will keep them the powers that be accountable for for making sure those demands are met you know we're all in a pause right now and we don't know when theater is going to happen again but i'm hoping we don't forget about our list of demands when in 2021 when tony season rolls around and we don't all go back to pretending oh we're one big happy family and oh it's such an honor to work in the arts when it's not sometimes yeah, this is like such a time of heartbreak, I think, for all of us. It's like we are all going through a period of mourning and grieving for the things that are going to be lost, which are great things if if things go well. You know, these are great things that are going to be lost. White supremacy fucking sucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and racism in theater fucking sucks also. But it's, it's just, I don't know, it feels like a lot right now. And I do wish the best of, you know, break a leg to the we see you people. And if we can help in any way we want to help but we want to see us more at tips at token theater theater with an re or find us on twitter or wherever we're easy to find we're loud and we're always there but you know it's we i don't know i want to see more than letters and i want to see more than susan collins reactions i want to see more than people being concerned and i want to see people taking action we need to take the figurative streets of Broadway and theater and go make those people listen to us. You you brought something up that I actually haven't talked about with a lot of people I want to talk about because I think it's one of those like like sticky little issues is is Montana Levy Blanco's Instagram video. Uh, Montana Levy Blanco is an Obie winning award winning costume designer and in 2018, he worked on this musical at Williamstown Theater Festival called Limpica, which I did see, which is which is coming to Broadway at some point. We don't know when anymore. When 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 are things happening? Who knows? Um, and directed by you know Tony winner Rachel Chafkin, and and in it he said that. He was he was dismissed from the production because she said that his designs his designs weren't good enough, basically. And they went back and forth on it. Tensions rose. And then she called her agent and said that he was threatening her. And then Rachel Chapkin issued an, an apology and um, committed to doing better. Uh, but what was really interesting is that... I feel because I love Rachel Chafkin as a director and I love Montana as a costume designer. So it was one of those times where, wait, I thought these were two people who who are on the right, who are on the same side, who are on the right side. Like Rachel's always talking about diversity. And if you've seen her work, like there, she doesn't tokenize people. Like it's always a wide array of people on that stage for when she's doing that work and behind the scenes. And so how, how, how is this happening? I mean, then let's not even talk about the other feud from last week between our parents, um, you know, Jeremy and Young, because holy shit, man, it's, I don't, what are we going to, what are we going to do? <laughs> Who do we believe? No, I mean, I, I don't know. There's such, such anti-black sentiment in this world that I, by default, will believe the black people. Because Latinx people, Asian people, everyone who's non-black, but also a POC, we are raised on anti-blackness. I was raised in Honduras, which is in Central America, where people who have very dark skin will make jokes about black people. And I'm always like, okay, look at yourself. Uh, you know, where do you think, who do you think your ancestors are? And all of that. So by default, I'm always inclined to believing the black person who is uh, not accusing, but who is speaking out about the way they've been treated by someone. Because we have seen the ways in which white women weaponize whiteness, but also hide themselves behind being a woman to Amy Cooper their way through the world. And sometimes this is done unconsciously, sometimes it's not like Amy Cooper, 
or that monster who, you know, accused Emmett Till of messing with her and the poor kid ended up beaten to death. But it's, you know, I was, I, it was so sad to see all of that unfold and so heartbreaking because yes, I love Rachel Chapkin's work and I love Montana's work, but I was very, I don't know, I was very pleased, I would say, with the way in which Rachel's apology came across as not as like, no, wait, I didn't do any of that, like that didn't happen, but it came across as like, I will sit down, I will shut up, and I will listen. And that gave me hope. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely one of those times where even if you think like you're doing everything right, right as, you know, a non-black person, like there's always some blind spots or some like some things that will come out of your mouth that you don't intend to be racist and and you'll treat certain people in a certain way that you don't think is racist because you think you're better than that. But we all, we all live in a society. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think if, I think these conversations would happen, wouldn't be happening in a public platform like Instagram if if we somehow could figure out how to have it on a, in a, on a one-on-one basis that is productive and unfortunate. And I don't know either of them like very intimately, but it just seemed like there was just no way for it to happen productively just between the two of them. And it, ha and it, and it escalated to being on social. So, which is, which is to say, try to solve things. White people just try to solve things amongst yourselves what eh, otherwise it's going to erupt on social media and we're going to and we're all going to have to hear about it and feel very yucky about it you yeah know, but yeah you know uh, just hearing you say that right now made me so i had the most shallow thought that i've had recently um because when i was rewatching the king and i the first thing that i thought was i will pray to god and every god in the world that Kelly O'Hara doesn't ever do something racist, because how am I going to quit Kelly O'Hara? Uh, and for for our next segment, we're gonna sing a different tune, whistle a happy tune, as they <laughs> say. We're going to be talking about The King and I because Jose loves Kelly O'Hara and I have opinions about The King and I. And we think, you know what? It's a, it's a fun time to just, just have like a discussion about, you know, these quote unquote timeless musicals. And, yeah, and sorry, go ahead. Uh, oh, nothing. I, I was going to intro The King and I, but right. you, you have anything, anything to say before I do that? No, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say that we picked this on purpose because we were so exhausted after American Sun and Passover last week that we were like, let's talk about something light. Yeah, racism. Let's talk about <laughs> racism. <laughs> let's talk about racism against Asians. That's much lighter. I mean, technically, it kind of is. So, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba 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 -ba. okay. So, <clears throat> the K and I is a 1951 Broadway musical written by Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein, who, if you are not familiar, who were kind of obsessed with Asians because their other musical, South Pacific and Flower Drum Song, were also about Asians. And The King and I is about a white woman named Anna Llewellyns who travels to Siam in order to teach the children of the king there, uh, King Mongkut, who in the, and we watched the 2015 Broadway revival starring, starring Jose's inner white lady, Kelly O'Hara. And, <laughs> and, and the daddy with a capital D, Ken Watanabe. <laughs> who who have a 
they hate each other and at the end end they kind of love each other and and Ruthie and Miles and Kelly O'Hara both won a Tony for their performance in that revival. And so if you would like to watch The King and I, it is currently on Broadway HD and PBS. So uh, The King and I was written in 1951. And I actually have, I did a an article a couple years ago, years ago for American theater about Broadway's obsession with Asians. And I did some research, and in his autobiography, Musical Stages, Richard Rogers wrote that, quote, Even though our view of Siam couldn't be completely authentic, Oscar and I were determined to depict the Orientals in the story as characters, not caricatures, which has all too often been the case in the musical theater. Our aim was to portray the king and his court with humanity and believability while avoiding the disease Oscar used to call research poison. So whenever I think of The King and I, I think of, it, it's very, um, it, it's, you know, it's one of my problematic favorites. It's one of Jose's problematic favorites. So my, so my thing with The King and I is, yes, I love the songs. The Lincoln Center production, I saw it live. The boat came on stage. I was on it. Ruthie Ann Miles started singing and she, and she like hooked me in when they start dancing i'm spinning in that ballroom with them i'm swept away by the romance and also really uncomfortable with the fact that everyone speaks pigeon english which and they don't know that the world is round or that snow is a thing and they need a white lady to teach them how to be quote unquote civilized and so when i whenever i think of the king and i i'm always like yes racist but also they tried (laughs) <laughs> they oh tried to not be racist hashtag your faves are problematic oh my god which is so oh my god that's so funny sorry i'm laughing but it's so funny because you're right but it also you know a few years ago i interviewed uh oscar hammerstein's uh grandchild and he told me that um his grandpa would spend hours and hours and hours and hours doing research on racism and race and why it was so wrong. Yeah, he tried. And why it was so wrong that pe- white people discriminated, you know, against Asian people, against black people, against Hispanic people. I mean, hey, I mean, every time I remember that Stephen Sondheim thought that I Feel Pretty was too smart a song for a Puerto Rican girl to sing, I want to burn everything down. So yeah, Sondheim, you're alive, you're still problematic, sorry. Um, but it's this whole thing where it's, you know, the, 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 the history of the Broadway musical is so fascinating to me because it's almost a history of, well, obviously of racism, but also of the people who think they're trying to fix it, but then they end up with like fucking Oklahoma, which like there's not a single like Native American character in the show. And the show is so good. The music is so wonderful and all of that, but you know, the question I think that this makes me think of is if the people who were trying were so bad at it, holy fuck, the people who were in trying just unleashed hell on all of us. Yeah, well, and, and I consider, like, compare it to Hollywood, like, what kind of, you know, works featuring Asians was Hollywood putting out? Probably not very much, right? Nope. Like, an- Anime Wong couldn't even get work at that point in... Yeah, and then like she's like getting all this like you know uh, recognition when she's been dead for like two thousand years. So fuck that. Like recognize people when they're alive. Exactly. Exactly. But it's kind of like and yeah, you think of and no when you're mentioning out, I, I I was thinking like the history of musical theater is a history of like white people trying to be less racist and just being just like two steps behind <laughs> where they should be. <laughs> And then thinking, like, they're supposed to get credit for trying. <laughs> I mean, a participation diploma? I don't know. I'm so sad this week. I don't know. I don't know. I thought even, like, the king and I was going to uplift me, but not even... When Kelly O'Hara can uplift me, it means that I'm in need of, like, more rosé. Well, your um, your failure was picking the king and I as a thing that's going to uplift you. When I knew, when you were like, let's talk about it, I was thinking, oh, man, we're going to go far into... <laughs> A, a whole other thing. I hope you're ready. 
what what should we have picked then? Like, I mean, <laughs> what is a, what is a musical that we can stream that we both love? Because you do love The King and I. I love The King and I. Yeah, but what what could we have chosen then? Like, dear listeners and viewers, what should we have chosen? <laughs> I mean, she loves me. It's all white people, but. I mean. Then it's fine. I want to talk about the king and I with you. Okay. I do want to talk about the king and I, because okay. F- oh, oh, fun fact. This is just a side note. I, I was just doing more research when I was watching it, and apparently, Yul Brenner, who played the king in who is not Asian, he played the king in the original 1951 musical, and then again in the 1956 movie, and then again in the 1977 and the 1985 Broadway revival. So it wasn't until the 1996 Broadway revival that they finally had an Asian actor play the Siamese king. Okay, my problem with The King and I is that... So people position it as an eats meets west kind of, oh, he, like... These two people, they're so different. And then they learn from each other. But if you really think about it, does Anna really learn anything from the Siamese court at the end of this? No, it's mostly her just showing these people what to do. And she has this whole song about how they all really piss her off and how they're like, and how they're all like, like frogs. (laughs) And so if you want to do, a show about eats me like two different cultures like there actually needs to be like an exchange of ideas but you know it was also 1951 so what else what do you expect but it, it, it was so interesting to me to watch it like really really watch it because previous times I watched it it was very I was in the theater so it was very much like ooh, pretty everything's so pretty <laughs> and now just like watching it with my hat on it was very it, it occurred to me like everything that Anna criticizes the Siamese, the king, king for like, you know, having a lot of wives, not believing in love, like seeing women as inferior, like that was also a thing in Western culture too. In 1951, it was only 40 years after women had gotten the vote. And at that point, women married women in America couldn't own, haven't, couldn't have their own bank account. And so the musician, the musical kind of positions Western ideals as superior without realizing that, no, you all are, we like Western people, Western people are funny. Western people are just as messed up, and you don't get to you don't get to go around the world and try to spread your ideals when your ideals are false. Yeah, I mean, let's not even go that far as to all like the social hy- hypocrisy that Anna has. Look at her fucking clothes. I mean, she has to wear this like giant thing because like all those like Victorian assholes were too horny, and if they saw an ankle, like they would just like probably like harass a women and touch a women. So women have to wear this like really uncomfortable looking giant hoops and like metal things like like they fucking need to wear well i'm cursing a lot today i'm sorry it's okay the people women have to wear a freaking armor so Mm -hmm. men won't touch them exactly how dare she comes and then she's like judging at all the hot guys with their pecs out and like all the women in their slim clothes and like it's the tropics it's very hot and she's judging these people because she wants to see them decked in this like horrendous you know, horrendous, stupid Victorian garb. Like, I mean, like, Anna, come on, get a grip, girl. No, I love that point because, you know, like those dre- those tie dresses, unlike that fucking hoop skirt, like you can run in that, you can move, you can kick people. And they're, and like, they're not wearing shoes, uh, which is, you know, like a whole thing. Like, why do white people like to wear shoes in the house? I have no, I have no, I, I, I I'm hoping that's, that's the thing that dies off in the COVID because it, it's nasty. Stop doing it. Okay. How would we improve it? Maybe just like skip to a whistle a happy tune and getting to know you and then stop it. And then we're like, okay. Or I know, oh, I know, I know, I know. So we get a performance and it's whistle a happy tune. And then we meet in the, um, what's that song called? No, I'm like 
shots, though. We, we, we kiss in the shadows. We kiss in the shadows, yeah. And we give, you know, we do that, and then we do getting to know you. Do you have a problem with getting to know you? No. It's cute, right? No, it's cute. It, it's the ideals what this musical wants to do, except it doesn't yeah. actually do it. <laughs> right? So then we do getting to know you, and then we do, we do not do what a puzzle meant, because, no. And we do not do the songs about Anna complaining about people not being white, because, ugh. So then we do the, those three songs, I guess. And, wow. hey, hey, something wonderful. That's yes. Ruthie's song. Like, Ruthie yes. needs to have her song. But yes. actually, I don't mind a puzzlement. And, and here's, and, you know, I will tell you why. Because it actually get, and the musical doesn't do this well at all, but, you know, hashtag, it tries. What it, it does, it gives a king a song, which for the time, Asian characters did not have like their own songs where they had interiority and they had like concerns that was separate from whiteness. Like the song of Puzzlement is the king trying to figure out how to be a better ruler and trying to figure out like how to be more modern and, and how to like be a king while uh, and have authority while also ha taking in other people's opinions and trying to balance all that. So it's very, it's very relatable if you've been in, in a position of power as a person of color. The only problem is the fact that he speaks in pidgin English and the, the rest of the time he's just yelling at everybody. And so yeah. I think if you made the king, if you made the king just rewrite his lines so that it's actually fluent English, he speaks in fluent English, it's a lot of, and they actually have real conversations where he's not just being like a brute to her. And he actually teaches her things out like Lauren Yi or or Young Jean Lee, like somebody just come in and just do a little bit of tweaking. Like you even need to change Anna's stuff. Like she can be problematic. You just need to change the Asians. Right. Give them agency. Because like I guess my problem with what a puzzle meant is that all these things that he's dealing with are things that have been questioned uh by white people, you know, all the things, all the way that he's ruling, for instance, it just doesn't feel right to white people. So that's my problem with the song. But yes, if they change it, they keep it. So we have Getting to Know You, Whistle a Happy Tune, uh, We Kiss in the Shadows, Something Wonderful, What a Puzzle Meant, and then after those five songs, uh, what about Shall We Dance? Shall We Dance, of course. Okay, because it is so sexy. I love that song. I mean, not the song itself, but Kelly and Ken, ooh. Anyway, Kelly and Ken for the Fifty Shades of Grey musical. Anyway, so we keep those songs, and after they sing those songs in their costumes and everything, we applaud, the curtain closes, and when the curtain rises, we get to see soft power. <laughs> yes, boom, double feature. I love it. Yeah, because what, what was always a cop-out to me about The King and I was, like, the ending. Like, I feel like Rogers and Hamilton sign just couldn't figure out how to end it. And so they're like, okay, he dies. Let's kill him. <laughs> Let's just kill him, even though he was completely fine. And if you have younger actors playing him, like, Daniel Day Kim played The King. He was a replacement for Ken Watanabe in, like, 2017. And who could believe that Daniel Day Kim would just, like, die suddenly? <laughs> Not me. Unless, wait, he was in Lost, and people drop dead in Lost all the time, so he maybe he was like, he the was... king and I meets Lost. The <laughs> monster took like, him. This whole thing isn't real. We're just on an <laughs> island. It's just all a fantasy. Oh my an God. oriental fantasy. So I mean, now what's... I'm wondering, after all, if I got any pleasure from rewatching the king and did, I. I mean, did you get any pleasure? I, I mean, I had fun. Yeah, I mean, it took I mean, me two I nights, but I had fun. I, I guess what I wanted was to have Kelly and Ruthie's voice just, like, fill my home and my ears with some beauty. Because mm -hmm. there's so much chaos and so much sadness and darkness going on everywhere right now. That those songs, you know, they're so beautiful and they uplift me. And I guess I wasn't paying too much attention to the rest because I know it's bullshit. So, I mean, they I took what the musical could give me and I side-eyed everything else that it did wrong yeah i think it's you know i think it's one of those things where i and we've i think we've both gotten used to just viewing entertainment in that way where oh it's this isn't for me so i'll just take what i can get from this so depressing 
I know, but it's like an, it, it's so it's such an instinct because that's what happens to me when I watch The King and I. It's like, okay, I know it's going to piss me off if I think about this too hard, so I'll just shut off my brain and just enjoy the pretty. Yeah, and skip the song. Yeah, yeah. Skip the book. Just have the songs, except for the House of Uncle Thomas, which is fucking bullshit. Still doesn't work. Stop trying to make it happen. It's never going to happen. And it's like forty minutes long. <laughs> so fucking. Oh no. It's so... Why is it so goddamn long? I don't know. Oh my god! But I never thought about that. And what I what I said earlier was right. That is teaching Siam anti-blackness. Anna, how dare you? Yeah, oh, my, and, and the thing is, like, I don't know anything. Of, it's like, I called, I, I had this on my notes when I was watching Uncle Thomas. It's like a racist sandwich. Because, because it's Asian people, as written by white people, interpreting a story about black people, but it's written by a white woman. Oh my god. No, it's like inception layers of racism and appropriation and like none of it works. It's like Rachel's trifle. Remember Rachel's trifle from friends when she puts meat in her like dessert? It is that gross, gross, gross. That's why it feels yeah, gross just, watching so, it. Yeah, just get rid of that number. Just just yeah, no one likes it. And the thing no. is you know, I, I'm think because I feel like The King and I is one of those things where I just, what I really want is, yes, we can revive it on Broadway with a big, pr- pr- with a gigantic budget and Asian actors. I just want community theaters and like low budget places to just stop doing it because you cannot pull it off. It's going to be offensive. It's just going to be a bunch of white people in eyeliner. Just don't do it. Because I know multiple white people who have done all white productions of The King and I when they were in grade school because it's a musical that can use a lot of people. That's horrifying. I want to go to April's interview now because I'm getting depressed. (laughs) Don't be depressed. This conversation is something wonderful. Welcome, April Mathis. Hello. Hello. Thank you for talking to us uh you're we're we're talking to you today because you just did a podcast two podcast episodes with uh playing on air uh night vision by dominique morceau and goat by ngozi and yahoo and can you tell us about that project and when did you record it because it just came out like right after we all got locked up and it just was the most convenient time yeah, yeah, no, it's really great the rollout of uh, like audio um, right now when we can't be in rooms together. Um, we did it a while ago. I don't even know when. I think maybe sometime last year sounds about right because I think I was doing Tony Stone and would like do these during the day. Um, and I don't even remember what the time uh between them was but uh, you know i hear dominique mariso and i'm like yep and i hear ngozi on one you and i'm like yes please so uh you know it was just fun to do and to be in the room with them and you know these are really quick and dirty like you might get a version of the script beforehand but then you basically read it with the people you're going to read it with that day and you meet them that day if you don't already know them um but uh yeah it um they're just great to do i like reading i like reading plays i like doing readings that's kind of like how i've gotten most of my theater jobs is not so much through auditioning, but through doing readings and workshops that turn into full productions. So I just like that. And I'm a big podcast person. So of course I was like, hmm, you guys have a podcast? Let me investigate. Um, So that's been cool listening to you guys' archives a little bit. Um, Well, thank you for that. Oh, well, I'm just just getting (laughs) into it, but there's so much more that I want to investigate. <laughs> well, 
This is the reboot of the podcast, so it's on a different feed. So hopefully, yeah, it's you guys are striking out on your own. Exactly. Yes, you're, you're the uh, tech. Well, technically, you're the second guest in the podcast lineup, but you're the first guest that we've interviewed. Okay. So yeah, how's it feeling? Oh, uh, scary. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit scary. It's intimidating, but I, I would love to learn a little bit more about the difference for you because one of my favorite things when I was watching you uh, play Tony Stone was how much you seem to be so present in the moment and you're listening and that's something that you know it's so refreshing to see an actor who's playing a character who's also listening mm -hmm. and I felt that a lot of your line readings and a lot of the way that you interacted with your co-stars in Tony Stone depended on that and how you know the way that you saw them move the way that you saw them deliver a line and I wonder when you're recording a podcast on your own in a studio somewhere and you can't see your co-stars how is that different and how did that I don't know challenge maybe your you know how you how you act on stage well we'll see because I haven't done it that way yet these because we did them last year we were all in the room together we were in, you know, Kilgore Studios, you know, so we could all see each other. It's just we didn't have that time to marinate as a cast, as it were. But, you know, I could see and react to, you know, Denise or um, Ngozi. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was um, like... What we're talking about with playing on air is now maybe in the fall doing some remote recordings where it's going to be me um, like in my own little makeshift sound studio. So we'll see how that is. What I did recently uh, last week, I did kind of like a web series that uh, on Zoom. So it's supposed to be like a Zoom meeting. <laughs> um, but it's hard because my direction was to look like just below camera. So like this, so I couldn't really see the people I was acting with. I could hear them of course, but I couldn't see their faces. Like now I'm looking down at you guys' faces and, um, you know, I miss that because I do get so much like the, the guys in Tony Stone's the best cast you can imagine and um like everybody just has their own school of performance and where they come from and you know some people like jonathan uh has a really strong musical theater background uh, but then eric berryman has like this kind of avant-garde background which is kind of where i live um philip does it all and is a, a wonderful, uh, really thoughtful, lived in actor. And then um, Harvey Blanks, you know, has been around and does a lot of August Wilson. And um, he was doing a tour of August Wilson uh, right before this happened. And, you know, it's just like a stage veteran and like has his own particular way of interacting with the audience. So they all kind of kept me on my toes. So I had to, mm -hmm. you know, flex to them, as we say in kind of corporate speak. Um, but that is what is so fun, is acting with actors that come from a totally different, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're all kind of pulling from our different toolboxes and just seeing how we work together. And it was exciting and different every night. Plus that and the alchemy of like, what an audience brings, which that's, that's what's really missing right now. Um, which we didn't have in playing on air, but like, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm gonna, like, how do you do these disembodied performances where you're not in the same room, you might not even get to look at each other and, and there's no audience. Mm -hmm. Like, um, there's nobody there's no even real time direction of somebody being like, okay, next time, can you try it like this? Or how about this? Or maybe we'll have that. I don't know. Maybe we'll, that'll still be available to us. But Yeah. It's just you in your closet right now. 
Um, yeah, when you're doing this acting. My wall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, you know, whatever ambient noise that I can't control because I don't have a soundproof booth to work in. But, you know, it's making a lot of us think now, like, if we don't have that kind of setup, maybe we should get that kind of setup. Because, you know, I had, like, things that will do in a pinch for self-tape before this. And I was in the habit of paying people to put me on tape because they can just do a way better job. I don't have to worry about that. All I have to worry about is the acting. And so I had been relying on that for, like, past couple pilot seasons. And now it's like, nope, 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 nope. You better figure it out. You better figure it out visually and sound-wise. And I had, like, a mic because... I do do some voice work, but like, I got to get a better camera and I got to get lights and background and all of that um, until things open up, it seems. Mm. I mean, and have you been consuming any like of these Zoom theater experiences? And do you think like that's like, do you think it's a stopgap or do you think that's like a potential future for the art form? I think it's a stopgap, of course. Nobody wants that to be how it's going to be. Like, everybody wants to be back in space together. And I've been kind of brainstorming with, like, different theaters across the country, which that's one thing that's been cool about this. It's like you don't have that barrier of, like, I can't travel. It's like, no, we're going to do. We can we can meet now. We can meet and plan and scheme now um, and do something that's maybe for public consumption or not. Uh, I've been working with this theater company uh, in Austin, Texas uh, with a couple friends of mine, uh, Paper Chairs with uh, Dustin Wills and uh, Elizabeth Doss. Um, and uh, we've been brainstorming about uh, a piece, a Eugene O'Neill piece, Skin of Their Teeth. And um, you know, I'm not in Austin. I don't plan to be in Austin, but the ways that we're thinking in and around, like, the medium of, like, uh, social media and digital media and what can be idioms, like, theater stage idioms for that, um, is... Those are interesting ideas to think about, but they do feel like temporary. And me, I haven't been consuming a lot of them. I've watched some of the 24 hour plays because they're a little easier to watch. It's just like, <laughs> look at this one person, look at this one crazy, amazing actor. Um, Ronald P did one recently that I was just like, that, yes, yes to that. Um, but like, uh, the ones that I've been a part of, I feel like maybe it is more for us, you know? Maybe it's more for those of us participating. Like, the act of doing it is satisfying because you're not scrolling, scrolling, scrolling on your phone. You're not obsessing about the news. You're not, like, you know, putting on hazmat gear to go by, like some oat milk or whatever like you you're doing what you used to do which is like acting saying words with folks in real time and the only thing I can think of that is equivalent as far as theater is it's in real time and so I'm trying to keep that like uh Jose you mentioned like being in the moment like we can still keep that even if we're not in space together. We can be in time together. So there's something that I'm hanging on to in the meantime about the immediacy of theater that we can maybe approximate for, for the time being. Throughout, throughout your career, you've been like able to navigate this really wonderful balance between doing like super experimental work, you know, like things like GATS, for instance, and your work with elevator repair service. But then you can go and do like streetcar and you can do Tennessee Williams and something like that. But as a, as a huge fan of your more experimental work, 
I wonder if there are elements about what's going on right now in theater where to me, and, I, and people think I'm crazy when I say this, but I'm so excited to see right now where theater can go because we don't know. And instead of like letting that paralyze us, I feel that it's the time for us to like experiment. And as someone, April, who's lived for so long in the, the experimental world, are you seeing things right now that also excite you about, you know, things that you've learned doing this kind of work that you want to see applied to stream theater or to Zoom theater or to things that can't happen right now because we don't we don't have a choice right now to, to gather and to be in, in the same space together? I have conceptual ideas and I'm like, should I share them? Because if I do, then everybody will do them or maybe no one will. But like... I, I think it has something to do with like time and what are the idioms and then, but like, I haven't tried them. So I don't know how long they stay interesting. And that's the thing with elevator repair service. Um, we work on things for years, you know, and you can see that in the work, like it's not just, something that somebody threw on the wall. Like it's something that like the dumbest little moment will be something that we have worked on for weeks to get perfect, to get the timing perfect. When this person does this, this person goes over here and picks this thing up and flashes it and puts it back down and goes over there. And I've seen like directors try to like do that in a rehearsal, like, one time we're going to like do this kind of devised moment. And it's like, no, 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 no. Those things, you can tell when somebody's like, let's come up with this thing right now. And when somebody's been like, let's make this perfect because this dumb thing is essential. And it, <laughs> it, it must be done this way to get the maximum perfect dumbness out of it. <laughs> um, like you have to be that nerd serious about it um and uh you know um it's interesting about like <sighs> this moment and responsibility and safety and how art and especially experimental art is not always responsible or safe and what does that look like right now? Like, can we, can we be transgressive? Like, um, folks are going out in, outside in large numbers in close proximity because they must. Um, is it 100% safe? You can't say it is, but um, like, I don't know. I don't know what to do with those thoughts right now. Um, what do we say is essential? And what do we say, what in our work as artists is that essential that we say, I'm going to risk it anyway, but without being... Uh, harmful. How do you do it in a way that's not harmful? So I don't know. I mean, like, what does outdoor performance look like? What does performance that's distanced look like? When will it look like that? Do you ventilate? Do you? And I'm not talking about like institutionally, because that's a whole other question about like, how are we going to retrofit, you know, spaces to accommodate uh, social distance? And, you know, that's but my my artist brain just has a lot of ideas and um, like trying to find receptacles for those ideas and testing them out while at the same time being where we all are, which is like, where are you today? Where are you right this second? Like, you know, do you need to like take care of your body right now? Do you need to go lie down right now? Do you need to um, like scream and 
uh, make make some stuff happen. Like uh, those are those are questions that I feel like we're all kind of asking. Yeah. Well, and and I don't really know if you've seen the petition going around from all of the Black Indigenous POC artists. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and I feel like an additional dimension from from these protests that have been happening is the theater industry looking at itself and figuring out like more equitable conditions for artists of color, and I and and like lately, like I've just been wondering like what does that look like in a new environment when we're also trying to navigate like physical health safety and we're asking actors essentially to risk their health in the future in order to do the art form and how do you ask people of that people to do that while yeah, while trying to while trying to have these conversations that we're, that we're having around around representation and around you pay them what they're worth is a very easy answer mm. because what i will say is like oh, maybe week two or week three after we shut down, I got a lot of things coming into my inbox from institutions being like, will you do a Skype version of this or do a video version of that? Um, and no mention of pay. What? <laughs> yeah, no mention of pay. And uh, this was right when unemployment was crazy. Like, I spent my full 72 hours calling nonstop the line, just trying to get through. And, you know, that didn't start kicking in for me until, like, maybe, like, a few weeks ago. You know, so this was, like, lost all your jobs, no prospects, and... Now you're asking me to perform out of the goodness of my actor heart and like put on makeup and look good and be chipper and like dive into characters. What? Like, I don't know where I'm going to get groceries. So I start with that because when um, the dust started to settle, and I got things in my inbox. And I'm not talking about just theater. I'm talking about like TV and film and all kinds of like, you know, hey, let's support, you know, small businesses. I'm like, am I not a small business? You know, um, independent contractor. Um, so when I got the first thing was like, this is an audition for something that pays union rates or this is something that uh, is not enough, but will not negatively impact any benefits you're receiving. Or here's just some money, because we know you're having a hard time. Those meant more to me than any kind of like pat statement or expression of, we understand what you're going through and it's hard. It's like currency is what makes a difference in a lot of these things, in a lot of movements and boycotts. So, um, and you know, like a few years ago, I was part of the Fair Wage on Stage uh, campaign that uh, fought for and won like historic wage increases off Broadway and. Off-Broadway was just a start. There are lots of other contracts. Um, but I think there's this idea that because you love it, you'll just do it. But, you know, we all have a bottom line and we all need to eat. And we can win awards and those awards don't come with monetary benefit. You know, so um, I would say that first and, you know, yes, of course, health coverage. Um, and when I was dreaming beyond like those things that should be basic, I was thinking, what would it look like 
if I could be in a show with like five of my favorite black actresses instead of like all of us in the room being nice to each other, being like, if I don't get it, I hope you do. Like, what if there were room for all of us in the cast? Like, I got a little bit of that with Fairview, but I would like that more and 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 more. Um, you know, there's just so much talent out there. And this idea that there, there can only be one or two you know, my biggest issue with uh, like the white institutional theater of like, you know, the, 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 the tokenism that's in there. Um, and there can only be one or it, it becomes like a black play. Well, mm -hmm. let it be a black play or and plus, can that be the default? Can that be the, the universal default story instead of just, okay, we're gonna do Raisin in the Sun or we're gonna do one of August's plays. Like there are so many people writing out there. There's so many new fresh writers and there are people who've been writing for like 20 years who like, let's bring back some of their work. Like, you know, um, what are they doing now? They, they're not um, early career writers. Like these people have been writing like, you know, Kirsten Greenwich is one of my favorite playwrights on the planet. Like, I would love to do a season Kirsten Greenwich. Like, that is what's exciting to me. Well, thank you so much, yeah. April. You have been a delight. I'm sorry that we can't meet in person. I hope someday we will be able to, but I'm a huge fan of your stage. We will. Stage, so this I look has been to a, a, a treat. So, can you do you mind telling our uh, listeners, our viewers, where they can find you and what projects? You know, this is your moment for you to push all the projects that you want people to be aware of that you're doing right now. So, where can they find you uh, on social media? What projects are coming up for you? And Instagram where is where you. I put stuff. So, I'm at April Mathis with two T's. So, I kind of, I don't know. Um, that's where you would be able to find stuff. There's the playing on air stuff. There's other stuff percolating that I don't know what will happen to it. Um, but I feel like if you want to know, Google me, math is with two T's. Otherwise, you, you'll be all right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I feel like because Jose and I are both on like different awards committees, like and we can't spoil spoil anything because everything got postponed. But mm -hmm. I feel like we have to congratulate you for your performance in Tony Stone this season and like all the accolades that are coming to you for that. I, I mean, I feel like how does it feel to know that this thing you did, you know, PC, you know, pre-COVID is getting recognition, but like we can't all be in the room to celebrate it's, it it's sweet because you know if i had known then like man suck it up like enjoy every moment because this is this is it for a little while like, you know um and also like i i lost a friend at the end of uh last year uh christine jean chambers uh, she's well-known photographer and playwright in the community and uh, like Tony Stone was like, like the pinnacle of a great, like artistic moment, um, you know, firing on all cylinders, finally getting to work with Lydia Diamond and um, Pam McKinnon and being at the roundabout, being the lead role at the roundabout. So all the nominations and virtual like award ceremonies that have come up have been just really sweet to say that like this this is important and they're not just you but there's a whole 
world of people also in their homes going through this that go, we value that. We value what you did. Um, so it's been really heartening. And some of us from uh, the Tony Stone cast and crew have been getting together as these little celebrations prop up, uh, come up just to like, you know, watch the awards and like really just hang out together. Um, um, so yeah, it's been, it's been fun for that. And usually like the announcements have come on like a terrible day. <laughs> like it'll be a day where I'm like, I don't know, man, I don't know how long I can do this. And then it'll be like, April, guess what? You got nominated for an award. And it's like, oh, oh, I remember you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's been nice. Because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a whole lot in word. It's all a whole lot. So there's a little bit of niceness. I'll take a little bit of niceness. Okay. And it's thank you, April, for talking to us. And it's that time again where we, we read the names of all of the people who are giving us 10 or more dollars a month because... I have no idea why, but we love you and we appreciate you. I mean, we love all of our patrons, you know? I mean, I've just been so impressed by how people have been stepping up during this time and just supporting the things that they believe in, including us. And, you know, Jose's had a hard week and I feel like I can't speak for you, but I feel like it's been it felt good to see people react well to the things that you write. I felt great. Thank you. Thank you for your support. It means a lot. I feel love. I'm going to cry now, so I'll hide. Okay. Jose's going to cry, and I'm going to read some names. For All right. So we have Alex Donnelly, Elisa Lopez, Amanda Finn, Benjamin S. Horner, Brian Herrera, Caroline Hong, uh, Charlotte Canning, Cynthia Furman, David Levy, Diane Wilshire, Demena, Emily Lathrop, uh, Gemma, Hannah May, Itzel Ami Ayala, and I'm sorry anyone whose names I'm butchering, uh, James Marino, Joe Cross, Joe Iconis, uh, Katrina E. McCain, Kyle Jones, Laura B., Maggie Gilroy, Mark Lowry, Matt Ross, Matt Tamanini, Megan Kingary, Molly, Nataki Garrett, Oliver Sava, Patrick Daly, Porsche McGovern, SF, Sonia Six, Sarah Kenny, Sarah Bay Chang, Sarah Storm, a lot of Sarahs, thank you all the Sarahs, Sarah Storm, uh, wait, no, sorry, sorry, Shauna Mefford Kelly, Susie Steffen, and last page. Ah, and he sat as Lano. Thank you all for being a friend. Yes, we love you. Thank you so much. Anything else you want to say to people? Well, if you want to tell us about musicals that give you joy and have no problems and no racism, you can let us know at on Twitter at Token T Friends, or you can email us at tips at tokentheaterfriends.com. That's theater with an R E. And visit us on tokentheaterfriends.com. And thank you so much for your support. It's been really wonderful. I, I have no words. I feel like Sally Field and you like me. You really, really, really like me mode right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, and, and do you want to do like the PBS pledge drive type? Please give us money speech. Oh, yes, of course. So, yeah, PBS is going to sue us for how much we've mentioned in this episode. Whatever. I gave them my um, five, I gave them $5 a month just so I could watch The King and I. <laughs> You're paying to be abused by Rodgers and Hammerstein. I don't approve of that. Um, so we love all of you, and we thank you for your support, and we thank you for your shares, but we do need your help financially. We are doing this completely on our own. We are self-produced. We don't have any donors. 
We don't have any corporations, organizations behind us. We have no one backing us up. So if you can spare anything, like even a dollar, and a dollar means the world to us because we wanted to give people the chance to contribute to us starting at a buck, because this is for all of you. This is not for us, and it's not for theater. This is for all of you, for all the people who support us, for the people who want to hear us, for the people who like us, I guess, who really, really, really like us. And if you can spare a buck a month, we love you, love you, love you. Our other two levels on our Patreon are five bucks and 10 bucks. And we know that this is a really hard time for everyone all over the world. And to be asking for money sounds like, you know, kind of shitty, but that's why if you can spare some money, we appreciate it. If you can't, we are very grateful for your listens, for your reviews on iTunes, for your shares. And every time you amplify our message, and, you know, a budding POC critic grows its wings. Oh, that was beautiful. Well, that's our show for you folks. And uh, tune in next week when we talk about a five-hour play that you can also watch. It's called 2666, based on the novel by Robert... Uh... Roberto yeah, Polanyo? Yeah, yeah. Uh, based on a novel by Roberto Bolaño, and you can find it at the Goodman Theater's website. Uh, we'll have the link below. So watch it, and if you have any thoughts on it, let us know so we can read them in, in the show next week. And the great thing about theater at home is you don't have to do it, do a five-hour show in one go. I'm going to be watching it over the course of four nights. Like and a I'm going to be watching it in my underpants. Yes. We don't wear pants anymore in this house. Okay. Have fun with that image. Bye. Bye.